Hey, listen, I'm excited about this series because God laid it on my heart several months ago because I needed to hear what it is that I'm going to say. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what God has told me to tell you as we think about how to use the signs in our lives to our benefit. Now, every single one of us has a strategy of how we deal with signs. Uh, Some of us, uh, we, we pay very careful attention to them, and some of us, we ignore them completely, and the rest of us are kind of somewhere in between. But today as we dive into this subject, I want to ask you to stop and think about the signs that you see every single day, all right? So when we see a green light, a green light means to do what? All right, when we see a red light, it means to? When we see a yellow light, it means what? Oh, see, it's kind of confusing there, isn't it, right? For some people, it's like the little boy at Rankin Lake Baptist Church years ago when I was the interim youth minister during the summertime, And we had this kind of thing in church back then where we had children's church, where we asked all the small children that were in the church, they would come down, they'd sit down at the front, and then the youth minister guy, when he would do his sermon, and I was the youth minister guy before the older pastor guy came to do his thing. And so we were sitting out the front, and that morning I had no time to prepare, or I had not prepared, I had plenty of time to prepare, I had 168 hours the week before, but I didn't. But I saw the stoplight and I said, I got it. And so I sat down and I said, okay, guys, I said, what is it? That happens, I'm going to fix this so it doesn't pop in your ears all the whole service. There we go. What happens when you see a, a light that is red? They said, stop. I said, okay, good. What, what does it mean when you see a light that is green? Well, of say, go. Then I said, and what happens when you see a yellow light? Kid says, I kid you not, punch it. <laughs> stood up in my best church lady voice, and I said, your parents need to see me after the service. <laughs> Lord, I'm not, any, I'm not anybody that can talk to anybody about stoplights and stuff, right? Hey, listen, this week, stoplights have happened. I've seen yellow lights, stoplights, green lights, orange lights, all kinds of stuff. And, and one of the things that we see when we see these, we decide we're going to pay attention or not. And so several times this week, I started to pay attention to what was happening when I saw yellow. Now, sometimes I saw yellow, and for me to stop would have meant somebody would have hit me from behind, so I I needed to go. Other times, I had plenty of time to stop, and at least once or twice I did because I had time to slow down, and it was appropriate for me to do so. But I've seen some other people do strange things about lights this week. We were on the way to, to lunch in Charlotte the other day, Jonathan and I were, and we, we were at the light where Amazon's warehouse is down here on 74 as you're crossing into Charlotte. And we came with this light, and it was red. And somebody's in the left-hand turning lane. It must have been 10 minutes before work started or something like that because this dude just kind of looked both ways and went left on red in front of everybody. I was like, dear Jesus, please protect us from... This guy that's driving this way. But coming back, also notice something as well. I bet you've noticed as you come back on Interstate 85, if you're headed south, like you're heading toward Atlanta or to Gastonia, if you don't want to go to Atlanta, and you, you come down, have you noticed that, that what they call the hammer lane is through? They don't have that anymore. It's got it's three solid lanes, right? It's the police officers call them hammer lanes. I discovered this because Lieutenant Jason Davis of the Belmont Police Department, one of our elders here, he saved us from many tragedies. I guess, guess what's interesting? My son's a firefighter here in Belmont. He said, since they have not allowed people to move over that lane into the middle lane, but they've made it three solid lanes, there are hardly any wrecks there anymore. Isn't that interesting? Now, when you go under the exit past Belmont Abbey and you start to go around the big curve, People slow down in large measure because people have been caught there speeding before, and they still think they need to slow down. But the other day, I was coming under the bridge at Belmont Abbey, just just right over here, and and all of a sudden, traffic slowed down. I was going 10 miles an hour in the fast lane. This causes me to do things inside of me. (laughs) I begin to pray for these people that are around me. I start to say things in my mind. They don't come out of my lips, but I say, Dear Jesus, Lord, help me, Jesus. Lord, have mercy. God, Father, have mercy. On these. <laughs> and then I discovered what had happened. All the way up at the McAdamville exit, all the way at the top of the ramp, was a blue light who'd pull somebody over. So everybody for the mile beforehand decided they needed to go 10 miles an hour because somebody had been pulled over. Are you with me? Does this do things to you like it does to me? Today we're going to talk about the yellow light. We're going to talk about caution and exercising caution in our lives. It's important that we do so. Last week in the newspaper, I pulled this out of the local paper, the Gaston Gazette. I pulled this story about Dave Dellinger who works at Floyd and Blackie's Coffee Shop. Maybe some of you know uh, Dave Dellinger. Have you all ever go to Floyd and Blackie's? 
Or you, you might go in there and say, I want to meet Dave. And, and here's what Dave said. He said, on the evening of Monday, March the 13th, 2017, Dellinger suffered a massive heart attack. He has this bodily disease that makes his heart kind of manufacture, his body manufacture cholesterol. It messed up his heart. It messed up his body. He said, it felt like a railroad spike was being slammed into the middle of my chest, he thought. I thought, I'm not going to make it. He said the pain was tenfold worse than anything I've ever experienced. Think about that for just a minute. Think about the worst pain you've ever experienced. Multiply it by ten. That's how bad he said it was. In the ambulance on the way to Caramont, a paramedic administered three doses of nitroglycerin, thinking that the drug would ease Dillinger's pain. It did not, he said, touch it. Quote, I rolled on my side, I said a prayer, and suddenly I felt a tremendous sense of peace, he recalled. I felt the weight of the universe lift off my soul. I felt so good, I chuckled to myself. Dillinger then lost consciousness until the moment he heard an authoritative voice shout, Clear! And he felt the pain of a full-power defibrillation. What Dellinger did not know, and he learned later, was that he had coded for 80 minutes. Caution. Live for a moment through the life of somebody else. Because of some of you are going too fast. And some of you are going too slow. Here's what he said. What he later would be told is that his life was, recommend, was saved by a drug recommended by one of the hospital pharmacists. Procainamide, I hope I said that right, a drug that had not been used at the hospital in nearly two decades, but was a last-ditch effort to save his life. So when y'all go to Floyd and Black, Blackie's and you get a cup of coffee, ask us to meet Dave and leave him a big tip because he loves serving people. Here's what he said he learned because of this experience he's gone through. One is that the love to is that the love toward which he has drawn was drawn, excuse me, let me start all over again. One is that the love toward which he was drawn is absolute and applies to every human being without exception. The second is that as humans, we are all connected. Have, a, have an overwhelmingly powerful feeling that we are all connected. The things we think separate us, the things we think divide us, are nothing nearly like the link that we share. Caution. Proceed with care. Now, there's a reason why we get a little confused when we start to think about what this yellow light means when we see it. It's because for some of us, it does mean punch it. Take the risk. Roll through there. There's some amens in the room. Some people raising their hands on the back row because you can't see them. For others, it means I better stop completely. Well, then you've got people piling back into the back of you like the roadrunner and the coyote. No, it means proceed with care. As we enter into this series, I want to challenge you to proceed with care. Some of you are about to make a relational decision in your life. As a matter of fact, you're in the process of making it. It's not like I'm going to decide about that this afternoon. No, you're in the process of making it. What am I going to do? Am I going to stay or am I going to go? Am I going to jump into that relationship that I know that probably is not best for me? Or am I going to go into that relationship because God is showing me that it is the best thing for me? Thank you, hello. Some of you are about to make a career decision. Hey, do it deliberately. Go forth with all deliberate speed. That's word from the Supreme Court from a a famous court case where they said that we needed to implement a certain kind of legal decision with all deliberate speed. That means you're deciding how fast it is that you're to go. Be cautious in that career decision. Some of you are making a financial decision now. It's about a purchase. It's about another card. It's about a vacation. It's about an experience. It may be about something that you need. It may be about something that you don't need. Caution, proceed with all deliberate speed. Some of you are making a spiritual decision. Some of you actually know what it is that you need to do. 
As a matter of fact, Doug talked a lot about our, our offering and why we do things. Literally, your money is a spiritual decision as well. But for the sake of moving on, let me talk to you about your soul. So many of you are making decisions right now with what am I going to do spiritually? Am, am I going to give my time and my talents and my treasures to be what God wants me to be? Am I going to give my ties and my transformation? I mean, not ties that you wear, but the ties I have with other people. You see, our mission statement at our church is to lead people to take their next step on their journey with Christ by loving Jesus and becoming like Jesus and sharing Jesus. I want you to say that with me. I'm going to give it to you phrase by phrase, so we'll say it together. Leading people to take their next step on their journey with Christ by loving Christ, becoming like Christ, and sharing Christ. And so now that you've talked about everybody else, talk about it to yourself. Our mission is to lead me to take my next step on my journey with Christ by loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing Jesus. That's what we're all about here. So whether you're making that financial decision, that spiritual decision, that relational decision, that career decision, that emotional decision, listen, don't always pay attention to your emotions because emotions do crazy things. Emotions are affected by life circumstances, by life hormones, and by other kinds of things, male or female. Ladies said amen to that. <laughs> Ladies, I got my husband's got some hormone problems. The first thing we need to do is, as we think about steps, is, is to step back. And ask God to teach me to have a wise heart. To ask God to teach you to have a wise heart. To, to teach us congregationally to have a wise heart together. Why is that so important? Literally in the book of Psalms, in the middle of your Bible, if you have one with you or if you want to dial into a U version or your favorite Bible app, there is one psalm attributed to Moses. Big Mo. Let my people go, Pharaoh. Come with me, Nefertiri, Moses. And here's what Moses says. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I wonder when Moses wrote this. I wonder if he wrote it right before God was to take his last day on this earth and to bury him in a place nobody else actually knows where he is. God took him and disposed of him so that nobody would go to the Moses mountain, in my opinion, to worship the Moses body. He said, teach us to number our days. Moses had 40 years as the prince of Egypt, 40 years in the desert, 40 years leading his people back through the desert so they might be able to go to be part of God's plan. You know why? You are here today. You know why I am here today. You know why there is a Jesus, why there is a one that has come to save and to redeem the world. Because that man learned to number his days because God had given him a heart of wisdom. How's your heart today? Listen, if, if your heart is not redeemed by Christ, it says that your heart is desperately wicked above all things and no one can control it. However, here's what God says to us. that We can have a good heart I will give them a heart to know me, that they will be, know my name and be my people. And then here's the thing. You say, well, my heart's still wicked. No, God is transforming your heart if you're a Christ follower. How, how do you love God with all of your wicked heart? Are you with me? So how do we learn to pay attention to our heart so that we might adequ adequately number our days? So what kind of things should we number? We talked over the last series if you've missed it, you can go back and watch it online about how we need to pay attention to our numbers relative to our body, our weight, our inches, our, our, our blood pressure, our heart rate. Only you can take care of that. The people that love you can't take care of that. They can make recommendations or they can nag you to death about them. By the way, gentlemen, if you treat your wife like a thoroughbred, you won't end up with a nag. I'm just saying that. So if you're here today, pastor's going to save your love life. You just say, hey, baby, you a thoroughbred. So what kind of things should I number? We've talked about body numbers and keep numbers of those. But here's the first one, our time. You have 168 hours a week. You have 10,080 minutes, or if you want to know, 604,800 seconds. 
Just use your calculator. It will come to you. What are you doing with it? Are you wasting it? Are you spending it? Are you investing it? Second, are my talents. So are your talents just for you so that you can do the things that you do and get the jollies because you do them? Or are, are your talents for somebody besides you in addition to just you? Listen, God wants you to understand this. We are not Buddhists. Buddhists believe that the whole idea of life is to eliminate all desire in your life. The psalmist in Psalm 37, 4 tells us, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. God is not out to eliminate desire, but what are your desires? Is your career, is your talent, is your ability, is your giftedness just For you, if it is just for you, it is wrapped up in way too small a package and making way too small a difference because God has made you to be the best you for the world and ultimately for Him. Also, we should measure our treasure. Measuring our treasure. What are we doing? Is is your money, is what's in the bank and the zeros that you have in your account just about what you have to blow it on or to... You can do the same thing with money you do with time. You can waste it. A gentleman or a man by the name of R. Kelly was arrested yesterday. He's made hundreds of millions of dollars, and he's done some bad things according to what is alleged against him. He had, they posted a million dollars bail, bond, whatever, which means he only had to really pay 10% of it. He couldn't find $100,000 to get out. He, he wasted it. Or you can spend it. And we do, we spend it we have, on things we have to spend it on. We have to eat and sleep and use the bathroom indoors and pay the heating bill and those kinds of things, right? So we, we, we have to be clothed and we spend it or we can invest it. So we've talked enough about money today, but here's the first thing I would just say to you. If you treat God with your least and your leftovers, why in the world do you think he wants to bless you with anything more? That's what we constantly say. Give God your first and your best. He'll take care of the rest. Enough said about money. Let's move on. My ties. What are my ties with other people? Who are the people you're hanging out with? Who is speaking into your life? Who's got their voice on your shoulder saying, do this and do that? Or you better say this or you better say that. Or is encouraging you. Who are the people you will never rise above the level of the people that you have around you? And I can tell you because, like police officers, interestingly enough, by the way, the gentleman that's our police officer today, when I was going through Cramerton, he was coming out of Cramerton, he pulled a U-turn behind me, I looked at my speed limit, it was 60, I was going 60, and it's really a 50, and I was going, oh crap, I'm going to get a ticket on the way to church, (laughs) talking about stoplights. I don't know why I said that, but I just said that. (laughs) He's my new friend, he's speaking into my life. No, sometimes your friends say, slow down. Stop. Sometimes your friends say, go! Go! I love what a gentleman said one time. He said, encouragement is sometimes a pat on the back. Sometimes it's a punch in the shoulder, and sometimes it's a kick in the dare air. The gluteus of Maximus. So what kind of ties do you have? Are you numbering your ties? What kind of people are you spending your time around? I want to just tell you something that I'm very grateful for and very excited about. I, I would say I'm proud about it, except my mom said, never be proud, just grateful. <laughs> it's okay, Mom, I'm being grateful if you're watching online. This is the highest season of group attendance we have ever had in our church. So if you're in a group, you're taking steps. I want to thank all those people, Doug and, and Francine and, and staff members who've helped to create. But here's the deal. We, we can lead you to those experiences. But the point I'm trying to make to get back to it is simply this. I see people all the time who are speeding along the road of life, and they're hanging out with the wrong people. And if they're not hanging out with real people, they're hanging out with the real housewives of Beverly Hills. Or last night, I got, right before I went to bed, I, I, I caught this thing called Temptation Island. I had to turn it off. 
I was going, really? We got shows where we got cameras with people doing this stuff. How are your tithes? And then finally, how, how's your transformation? What are the numbers and your time, your talents, your treasure, your ties with other people, and your transformation? On a scale of 0 to 10, would you rate 0 being, man, I'm just not doing very well. 10 being, man, this is awesome. It's off the hook. I'm living in the midst of what God wants for me, and I'm feeling outstanding. But think also about your transformation. We spent last fall talking about transformation. If you missed these messages, you can watch them online. You can go back to the points page on YouTube and go back and watch those things. But here's how you know you're being transformed. We, we can see it in one verse in the book of Galatians. It's actually a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Galatia. And he said, these, but the Holy Spirit, if God's Spirit is living in you, if you belong to Him, produces this kind of fruit in our life. Love. Joy. Peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. There is no law against these things. So let me ask you this question. How's your goodness score? On a scale from zero to how's your patience? How how is what's your peace score like? As you are Advancing in your days, as you are numbering your days and hours and minutes and seconds in your life, are you moving the scale? If you're not, there's someone who wants to do something in you, but pay attention to the signs. Be cautious. Next, we need to stay in our lane and in the speed limit. We need to stay in our lane and in the speed limit. Why is that so important? The author of Proverbs, Solomon, tells us the wise are cautious and avoid danger Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. I got this. I can do this. I can make this light. Somebody said a redneck's famous last words, or y'all say it with me. Hey, y'all, watch this, right? Some of y'all, I didn't know that. Well, now you do. Write it down. Solomon also says, the prudent see danger. Prudent means the wise. Not just wise and smart in their brain, but they've connected their brain to their heart, and they're connected and they make a decision for the soul and the body so that life might be maximized. He said, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the wicked keep going and pay the penalty. Somebody else translated it this way. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the evil keep going and they suffer for it. Let me ask you this question. Any of y'all ever suffer because of a decision you made? Man, yeah, me too. <laughs> You're like, which one? <laughs> when I stay in my lane and I stay in the speed limit, I'm okay. I told the officer out there today that when I, when I saw him behind me, I got very spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> and I remembered I had cruise control in my car, so I just set it exactly on 50. And from Cramerton to Belmont, I was good, at least for one day. Next, we need to stay cautious until God gives me the green light. Stay cautious until God gives you the green light. Don't, listen, when you see yellow, the, the, the temptation is, if you're too careful, it's just to slam on brakes and stop. And then somebody's going to hit you in the rear. The, if you are somebody that is too anxious or so, too motivated to get somewhere, you might punch it and you might hit somebody. I've I've pretty much stopped punching it in my life as a result of something that happened several years ago. I was on the way to the post office at 4.52 on Friday afternoon. And I was headed across the bridge of Interstate 85 from Red Bud Drive. And before I left, Andrea said, it's not worth hitting anything to get to the post office. And so I headed up over the hill, and it was back in the day when they were redoing the exit on the other side to, to get you on southbound, and they had that exit blocked off. And I came up over the hill, and, and uh, I, there was somebody parked right in the middle of the two lanes. You could tell this person wanted to get on, but they didn't know what to do. And so because it was 4.55 by this time, and I had to do something very important by making it to the post office, I, I kind of 
punched it, and I went around them. By the way, you know you don't go around anybody in an intersection. It will cost you $10,000 at least or insurance points and lots of money for three years. I know that because right at that time, she said, I'm just going to do a U-turn and go back the other way. The right side of my car hit the left wheel of her car. It instantly broke my wheel off and broke it at the axle. All my airbags deployed. And she went spinning out. And if she had turned one half of a second before then, I'd have been a murderer. The prudency danger and take refuge. The wicked just keep going and suffer for it. Be careful. Be cautious. Look at these words from Ephesians chapter 5. You need to insert the word be. I left that out for you here. That's my fault. That's not anybody else's. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Hey, listen, today let me teach you a prayer. Hey, God, would you help me to be wise and not be foolish? It's that easy. Andy Stanley, one of my favorite speakers, when I get to heaven, I'm going to say, God, why do you make me as good a speaker as Andy Stanley is? And he'll say, because I want to make you you, and whatever he's going to say. He said the, most wise, the best question ever is, what's the wise thing to do? What's the wise thing to do? Whether you're buying something, getting ready to interact with somebody else, whether you're going to make a decision spiritually with something that you're going to make career-wise or vocationally. Hey, what's the wise thing to do? What should I do? Joshua said, the successor to Moses said, so be very careful to love the Lord your God. Let's go back and talk about our hearts for a minute. If you accept Christ as Lord and you say, I want Jesus to come to live inside of me, my, my thoughts, my emotions, my life begins to be transformed. He changes me. He gives me a new nature. He gives me a new destination. But, but the rest of my life, he is, he is making me more and more like him. It, a spiritual word for that is sanctification. I like to replace the word NCT with A-I-N-T and say it's sanctification. Because you're not merely Nathan. You're not merely Shannon. You're not merely Daryl. You're not merely Francine. You're Saint Nathan, Saint Shannon, Saint Daryl, Saint Francine. We're told in the book of Ephesians, we're no longer fellow, we're not strangers and sojourners. Rather, we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You have a new identity. So instead of God just sanctifying us. I'll, that's, that's cool. That's an like appropriate theological term. God is saint, like as in New Orleans, sanctifying us. He's making us more and more and more like him. So how do we do that? By paying very careful attention, says Joshua, Moses' successor, to how we love the Lord our God. So here's, here's Joshua's mission Moses is dead. Everybody's followed him. He's led them out of the promised land, or out, out, of the, out of Egypt, out of slavery. Now you're to lead them in the promised land. you got to go fight a bunch of battles in order to make it. So what did Joshua learn? Joshua learned as his life was drawing to a close and he was coming to his last words. He's saying to the people, so be very careful to love the Lord your God. So you say, well, how do I do that? I'll tell you how you do it. You say, Hey, God, if you say, God, I want you to make me wise. Say, God, how, how do I need to show you that I love you better? God's not playing a shell game with you. He will show you. He will show me. When we say, God, how am I supposed to love you today? Is it with my time or my talents or my treasures or my ties or my, my transformation? What if you could empower God, do all five at the same time? Me and God could do a fist bump and a high five because I'm working on all five at the same time. But what? What you do with your time and your talents and your ties and your treasure and your transformation. Next, we need to pay attention to our hearts after we ask what God wants. I mean, I need to pay attention to my heart after I ask what God wants. When I ask that question, he's going to show me. Look what it says here in 1 John. John was a follower of Christ. He's writing to a group of people that were in the first century. Some of the later letters in the first century, probably 60, 70, 80, 90 A.D. 
60 years after Jesus had gone back to heaven, he's talking to this group of people in this church. He says this, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. What an incredible promise. If our hearts don't condemn us. Now, here's what happens. When I start to ask God for things I don't need, and He knows that I don't need, I get this lid. I, get, I, I can feel it. I can feel God go, mm-mm. It starts when you're little, when, when you want an extra cookie, and then when you go to, get older is when you want an extra car. <laughs> Or bigger house, or just some, and it, all those things are fine, y'all. But run it through the sieve of your heart. I want another relationship. Be cautious, because people are people, and they all have their moves. What does that mean? It means if we ask God, we can move forward. Literally. St. Francis of Assisi said it this way, or maybe it was St. Augustine. Maybe double check me. He's smarter than I am. He said, here's the one thing you need to do in life. Love God and do as you please. Stop and think about that for a minute. Love God with all of your heart and then do as you please. What's the catch here? If you love him with all your heart, you're going to do as he pleases. Are you with me? Some of you out there going, oh, I get it now. Thank you. <laughs> Next, remember this as we draw this to the conclusion. When I walk it out, God's joy starts coming out of me. When I walk it out, joy starts coming out. I start giving more. I start loving more. I start being kinder. I start, start being gooder. <laughs> I know that's horrible English. I started to be better. I started to be gentler. I've seen it in the limited experience I've had with these things in my life. This stuff works, y'all. And I want more of that. Don't you want more of that in your life? Pay attention to the signs. Be very cautious in how you live. Be very cautious in loving the Lord your God. Be very cautious with today because the days are evil. When I walk it out, joy starts coming out. Look at what it says. John writes again in another little tiny letter in the New Testament to these very same people. He says what my mom's favorite verse is. You know what my mom says her favorite verse is? This one. Let me say it in my mom's voice. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. God has no greater joy than when we're walking it out. When we're being appropriately cautious... When we're loving him with all we've got and doing as we please. So the so what today is simply this. How are my numbers? How are my numbers? Only you can answer those questions. All that we post throughout this, and, and now what is, here, here's the bottom line today. Ask God to help you move forward with all deliberate Speed. You think about that. Let's we'll please you. God, I pray your blessing over every man and every woman, every child, those that are here, those that are watching online. And I ask, God, that you would fill them with all of your knowledge and all of your spiritual understanding, that you would make them wise and help us to watch our numbers. And to move forward with all deliberate speed as it pleases you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.